So piercing the veil serves a request for G2 Nipperna access. Um, who I, I'm a offensive web application security researcher. I work as a bug bounty hunter full time on various bug bounty platforms such as Hacker One. Bug Crowd, Synac, Integrity, and etc. You can find me on Twitter, uh, LessHerrera underscore. So we're going to be talking about why SSRF is, how the methodology of exploiting it works, and how it intertwines with cloud security and generally the heavy usage of cloud platforms nowadays, as well as discussing more esoteric or exotic ways of how SSRF works and is discovered in as well as more common bypasses for how SSRF works, as well as the endangers of internal services and how they tend to impact your overall security on your websites. Then we're discussing the case study of, of hacking the US military and generally how it was impactful enough to warrant a critical response, as well as, and then finally we're gonna wrap it up with a mitigation methodology for how to prevent SSRF attacks and how to prevent lateral movement through networks. So the preface is this, what is bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs? Essentially, a vulnerability disclosure program is the, a process where you're able to disclose vulnerabilities, primarily security vulnerabilities in organizations or websites without having any legal rep repercussion brought onto you for hacking into them. Bug bounties are essentially the same concept, except you're being rewarded for what you found, and generally a lot of websites are nowadays doing it from governmental organizations all the way down to Fortune 500 companies and various tech companies. Um, governmental organizations are actually mass adopting it nowadays with the United States Department of Defense widely adopting it throughout their various branches of military from the U.S. Army to the, NAP to the U.S. Air Force all the way to even having bringing on hackers to test on their, F their F-15 systems as well. So what is service-side request forgery or SSRF vulnerabilities? <laughs> a service-side request forgery vulnerability is essentially the ability to maliciously route a request to either internal, into the internal landscape or externally through to a target it's not supposed to access. Primarily, SSRF occurs in instances where an application allows you to make a URL request or an IP request. A lot of web applications tend to allow you to do this from, say, a user wants to remotely import their RSS feed or, in some cases, with several web forums, they allow you to import a remote image to use as your profile, which, which is an external URL request. The general tendencies of SSRF is that it normally appears benign at first, as I've encountered developers who initially wrote off the ability to simply make a request as something that could be maliciously, could be maliciously used. Though SSRF, though the dangers come when you're using internally facing land, um, services, such as Redis, SMTP, MongoDB, things like that on your local scape, because you can use local IP addresses and local hosts to route normally a request that's supposed to be outgoing to ingoing and to be able to access these services and also subsequently route requests to them as well to retrieve data in some cases. It's been around since the late 1990s. It was first described in FRAC in 1998, where Cold Fusion 3.1 had the function to hide the administrative panel in the local host or from a specific IP address. The issue with that was that a user found that you could access a, an unauthenticated endpoint that would essentially request the URL and then give you back the what the data was for that web page. This led to the attack, so it led to the researcher subsequently using, chaining the fact that, chaining the fact that you could request the URL with the fact that the administrative panel was only locally hosted. So they used the locally hosted, they used the local host IP address as well as, as targeting the administrative path to access the administrative panel and subsequently conduct as administrative commands unauthenticated. 
the general gist of SSRF is generally like this. A attacker sends a request to the victim server, and then the request, depending on where it's pointed at, will go either to their external facing server or to, to the victim's internal networks. SSRF can manifest in more exotic or interesting places, un unlike where it's normally found in with web applications. We can find this in places where you are, where users allowed to upload files or input data. Server side processing, usually, server side processing of files without any proper sandboxing can lead to these external or internal calls being created. In one case, F in one case, FMPEG has vulnerability which will let you create an inbound or outbound request just by having the video file processed by the server. Sub subsequently, Image Magic also had the same issue as well with Image Tragic. You can also perform SSRF through external entities for XML. Um, word documents are essentially I've zipped up the XML files, and if a server processes these entities, it could also create a now bounds or internal request. And more, more in depth, these attacks are, for example, CVG files. They are essentially XML files as well, so you could also use XML entities in them, but you can also reference an internal facing IP address or an external one, and it will create this request if these files are or process service side. Additionally, you could also, and also in some rare cases, you can also reference internal files and use that to fingerprint the system too. Um, if you were to reference the, the Ubuntu logo on, on the, through the CVG file, it would show up in the file. And it would subsequently allow, allow you to know that you are using, that the victim server is using Ubuntu. Word files, as I've said, are basically XML files, and entity attacks are simply just using the Nexo tag in the XML document to create a request used through the system command. And when the server processes it, it will subsequently fire the, fire the entity and then make the request to your server. Image processing using image magic or any sort of vulnerable image processing would allow you to also create these requests. Image tragic is essentially a vulnerability that let, that allowed an RCE or a remote command execution in processed image files. And you could also use that to create a curl request to an internal landscape. View processing using FFmpeg is another example that's popped up lately. Essentially, FFmpeg allows you to use HLS or HTTP live stream playlists, which could contain references to internal files or subsequently external resources as well. And these could also create an outbound request. Essentially, how it would look on the back end would be that the server would convert the video file that of the, that the attacker uploaded and then it will create a request to the attacker server. As a lot, a lot of web developers think that the easy solution to simply disabling or preventing SSRF attacks tends to come from just blacklisting local IP addresses or disallowing users to input those addresses altogether, which isn't exactly the best solution as there are many ways to bypass this. In some cases, you can use IPv6 alt, um, variants of it to access it, or using more rare exotic ones like using a simple zero to also access the localhost. There are also other ways to do this as either through re redirecting, having the web application request your, your website, but then subsequently redirect afterwards to a local IP address or a resource. Or you can also do a DNS record as well. Nip, um, Nip.io is an example of a website that lets you do the setup, that lets you set this up um, seamlessly without any much effort as you can just simply route whatever IP address you want to it. And then there are more obscure ways to do encoding as well, such as using an encode hexadecimal encoded IP address, which would be allowed in, in quite a lot of cases. You could also use closed and alphanumerics in other cases as a representative of a website or a local IP address or service. Internal services 
internal servers can circumference mainly web applications either through cloud services such as AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. And they are, they are most commonly mapped to 169, 264, 169. And they can give a high level access to these instances in a lot of cases. AWS, you can get credentials for the actual AWS instance and subsequently control the server from there. Google Cloud would give you access tokens to the actual instance as well, and you could also create a SSH key to create an SSH access to the server as well. This could also give you access to the Kubernetes certificates as well. In most cases, a lot of these cloud servers don't actually have many security measures for the, for the users to use. And when Azure is is one of them that uses a it uses a header method to as a security solution where it, where the requests have to include a specific security header or else the request will not at all be allowed. Google Cloud used to also also does this, but there used to be a way to bypass this as they had a beta endpoint that lets you subsequently access it without any need to send headers. AWS has none of these, and they, I believe they are trying to implement some solution, but the general knowledge of these endpoints or the access, or ability to access these or what the severity of these, if they are, if you're able to access them, isn't really made clear. They are very briefly mentioned on the AWS page, for example, and Google Cloud's page, but they aren't really talked about as much as you would expect for something that could give you total access to a, to your server. So how explain SSRF for fun and profit would start off with basically you, in one case you can query an external service as earlier mentioned, but this necessarily doesn't give you much access or anything really. But in some cases servers will give you headers or information that alongside the request that might give you ac further access or information on how to laterally move through the network. In some cases, I've seen servers giving the expert IP addresses that I could use to further test for or look to see if I could access them specifically, giving me access to panels or anything that might have popped around. In other cases, there could also authorization headers for certain services as well being thrown in there. Accessing local server and services such as Redis, Kubernetes, SMTP, MongoDB, things like that is another option as most of them are usually non-authenticated and especially when they are locally facing as developers don't expect people to be able to access them and subsequently just let them be open and subsequently you could access them if you're able to route requests to them. You could also Kubernetes for example has an endpoint where you're able to grab the tokens and keys from them with, with pretty much just through a simple URL quest. Then there are, then there is protocol smuggling, which is like the using certain protocols such as the Gopher protocol, TFTP or the SFTP protocol or the file protocol to perform more specific attacks. The Gopher, pro, the Gopher protocol, for example, lets you send requests with a return car carriage return line feed. Which is, which sends that you break up commands subsequently and send multiple requests to an endpoint or a service. This tag could, for example, go for, the Gopher protocol, for example, can let you use some other requests to the victim's SMTP server and then subsequently let you send an email from there, which will look, which will be legitimate because it is from coming from the SMTP server. And thus the implications of this means that an attacker could Either send emails to users asking for passwords or things like that, but as the email is coming from the actual server, it would look completely genuine and legitimate to the users. It could also be used, for example, emailing other devel the developers of the company or staff to ask for certain things that that you could gra grab through social engineering as well. You could also use the file protocol, which is essentially the a protocol that lets you access files and read them off. And in some cases, you can do this if the web application using curl to send requests. And again, as another example, Kubernetes also has another has a file endpoint where you can also access tokens or certificates. Then there is 
because this API calls, API calls as previously, previously mentioned, which lets you grab credentials and access tokens or certificates, which could give you some quite high level access to these servers. And from there, it's pretty trivial from to essentially taking over the entire website and access and further moving, pivoting from there. Then the other most, another more appealing tax service is the internet panels. Love. A lot of administrators have internally facing admin panels or analytic panels or things that are only internally facing for some cases. Um, for example, like Cold Fusion 3.1 had an internal facing admin panel which you could access subsequently. So a case study into the United States Department of Security, DD Security. So the background of this research started off with a simple tweet discussing how how attackers were now scanning for a specific vulnerability in Altezian products, specifically Jira and Confluence. As, as the vulnerability stated, it was simply a SSRF attack, and the attackers were simply scanning for AWS endpoints, specifically so they could get access to the access to the credentials for those servers. This led me to look into more about it and seeing why it kind of suddenly popped up out of nowhere, as I haven't heard, I hadn't heard the vulnerability at the time, nor had many other people in the field. So it seemed like the vendor, uh, seemed like the vendor either downplayed the severity of the issue or that the vulnerability had no actual proof of concept until now. After further researching, it really did seem like the vendor actually just downplayed it, as they made it seem like it was a third-party plugin rather than a rather than a core functionality of this product. The exploit was simply a parameter that would make, that would make a URL quest and then subsequently render it into the web page, which would allow an attacker to render whatever internal facing admin panel or things like that into the web page, and then. Subsequently, how I would go, how I wanted to test, how I wanted to test this vulnerability story was simply using the U.S. Department of Defense's vulnerability disclosure program to specifically see if they have this vulnerability, and subsequently how this vulnerability would have allowed access or allowed you to laterally move through networks. To start, to essentially start this, it was started with a Google Dork, which essentially gave me back a a list of basic military servers that were using Confluence or Jira. And in this case, I use Google, and specifically Google Darts are basically operators that let you refine your searches and search, your search functionality to aggregate more specific data. You can, in my examples, I use in URL, which lets you specifically search for string, specific pieces of strings of data in the URL of the web page. And then subsequently using the site, the site query to specifically look for all websites that end with the military domain. Exploring the OWASP vulnerability for, for fine profit was quite easy as to first verify it. I simply just had to use it to query google.com. And if the web page loaded google.com, then it subsequently proved that it was still vulnerable to this vulnerability. The after digging through some research about like how government servers were set up and subsequently how they worked, we found that that quite a lot of them actually used AWS, specifically AWS. It was called specifically AWS Gov, and they cannot. They also subsequently were used for some high, for some higher level access for classified data and things like that. This meant that I could could in theory access this AWS and possibly have access to more higher classified data. And from here, I decided to see if I could access the AWS metadata endpoint by specifically querying to see if I could access the host name for the server. From here, I also tried to pull the credentials, but it seemed like they were easier locked down or that it was disabled on this website. Additionally, Another more interesting, after this failed, I decided to see, look into more, another way to possibly attack the, the attack their internet. Um, the US Department of Defense uses a thing called the Non-Classified Internet Router Protocol, or the Nippernet. It is specifically a sensitive but non-classified network data that is subsequently used on military bases and the like to, specifically for 
either internally facing websites that shouldn't be shouldn't be accessible to the general public as they contain vital functions or that they contain data or services that might be necessary for in current operations or security things like that and from here and the biggest issue I had was subsequently finding how subsequently finding different net URLs as you can't really find a list of websites that that give that are only allowed on the they're only allowed to be accessed through the Department of Defense's network. This led me to finding out that another researcher was conducting similar research with HTTP of um, specifically hidden HTTP attack surfaces. And in his research, he mentioned that he found a web forum for military for military members that that discussed certain specific URLs that if you were able to access them on a military network, they would load completely fine for you. But if you're able to access, if you access them on the clear net, you wouldn't be able to access them at all as they wouldn't load. And this gave me, I guess, the start for to test them as well. The first URL I tested simply gave me back a giant, scary-looking U.S. government do not touch type warning sign. The other website didn't load at all, but it didn't load at all and just timed out. Then additionally, I started checking for the specific protocols I previously mentioned, such as the Gopher protocol and things like that. Though this didn't really turn anything as the website simply said that the atten these protocols were not at all registered or enabled. And then I also tried to look for any sort of services that were, being, that, were late, that were on the internal networks as well, which there was none. This is what, this is what it would look like for when it, when it rendered Google.com for me. And when this is for accessing the AWS metadata endpoint, it gave me out the host name of the website itself as, and a bunch of redact, more or less redacted data. This is one website that time, this is one of the Department of Defense websites that actually timed out. This is when I'm um, accessing localhost and trying to see if there were any other ports on there, such as eight, port 880. And this is this big scary banner I got for accessing the other Nippernet URL, which subsequently led me to stopping all my testing as, didn't, as I wanted to report it right away. And the subsequent reports that followed it. The general key points of failure for the Department of Defense simply started from the fact that although they did lock down the credentials, they, did st they still left a bunch of other sensitive data accessible to an attacker and this could allow more lateral movement as it gave back IPs, IP addresses and other information on what sort of, like, what sort of data was being hosted on there. The other thing is that, is that they didn't force, they didn't force credentials for once for all of their sort, all of the websites I did find that were vulnerable to it. <laughs> They didn't have any network seg uh, segmentation, which was basically that they had no, they didn't create any sub networks to prevent any lateral movement through their networks. And even though one server was act was listed on a different subdomain than another one, I was able to subsequently move from one server to another and access data there. This wasn't exactly the best thing as an attacker could easily just seamlessly start aggregating more or scanning the entire network from there to see if they have any sort of services or panels that might not be externally accessible or had no authentication to them, which an attacker would be able to easily aggregate data for on soldiers or things like that. The biggest thing was that they just threw out the patch an issue for that was several months, that had a patch out for several months out, and that tends to be the largest area where vulnerabilities tend to manifest as Many vulnerabilities are simply easily fixable by just simply patching the vulnerability itself, or keeping up to or keeping up to the patches rather. And most commonly, I've noticed that a lot of website, well, most of my vulnerabilities have been from the fact that a lot of website owners do not actually patch their software in a timely matter, manner, especially if the vulnerabilities were, even if the even if the vulnerability that was that had a patch out for it didn't have a known proof of concept 
uh, simply the fact that having no proof of concept or any sort of live exploit at the time of the patch doesn't mean that you're safe or fine. As I've developed exploits for vulnerabilities that had no patches or any sort of live proof of concept at the time. And I was able to find websites that were vulnerable to these vulnerabilities, for example. And then subsequently reinforces the idea that you gotta stay up, up to date on patches as hackers will develop exploits for your instance. Even if there isn't a vulnerability out there, as it won't take much to div check different patches and see what data, what, see what code was added or not added for a specific vulnerability to patch it. Generally, mitigating SSRF is you uh, generally mitigating SSRF tends to start with understanding what what are you using. So, with cloud services, if you're using cloud services, you need to enforce where API calls are allowed to originate from. Specifically, are they being allowed to originate from the external area where the requests would normally be allowed from, or were they being made by an attacker in the sense where they're doing some weird thing with the server? And another thing would be also enforcing specific security headers or implementing your own solution for that as most SSRF, SSRF attacks won't actually allow you to make headers, make subsequent headers to be included along with the request. And another thing would be essentially internally firewalling how the networks interact, the securing down how they talk to each other, preventing crosstalk to unnecessary servers or generally allowing them to talk to any other servers that it shouldn't have talked to would generally be, generally prevent a lot of issues. Then enforcing proper access control for in these internal services, such as using authentication panels for these internal services, such as Redis or SMTP Mon or MongoDB and things like that, requiring authentication. Although might create a bit, might create a slow down F, um, work for developers. It might it will be overall generally more secure, as an hacker would need to know these credentials for these services without before accessing them and controlling accessing the data that's within them. Another thing is, generally speaking, that gen networks and the like tend to allow you to do... <laughs> Another thing with the cloud services is that be more careful with which services you use as certain ones that give you certain levels of access that others won't. I know that some cloud services such as Azure or Work with Cloud, for example, don't actually let you use any sort of doesn't allow you to use any sort of way to grab credentials from them, and they only allow you to give you back either statistics or general analytical data about the server, such as uptime or things like that. Whereas stuff like AWS or, or Google Cloud, for example, allows you to grab sensitive tokens or passwords or credentials in that case, whereas it wouldn't be necessarily necessary for most developers to need that sort of high-level access on demand. Then there are also other alternatives to to also help you secure applica web applications to themselves. As there are like applications such as Save Curl, which would provide these a more secure solution to using Curl in PHP. Then there's also Advocate, which is a suite of tools that lets you further refine how certain services act and certain services and the like um, work out and talk to each other and generally preventing or preventing uses of protocols or more or less calls or requests that shouldn't be made. Um, another thing is that Google Cloud actually has Google Cloud actually has like started pulling, has started refining the security on their services as they, as they're starting to close down the beta service endpoint, which was initially the bypass to let you access the initial credential, the credentials endpoint without any authentication previously. Um, as far as knowledge and sources, network, the network information, network information security team has put out, um, an article discussing how to prevent credential compromise in AWS. In general, that's just where I got most of the information about how AWS security works. There's also the SSRF Bible, which gives us at length about the various protocols and ways that SSRF could interact with internal services. Then there is a new era of SSRF exploring URL parses by Orange Sci, which discusses more unusual ways to bypass SSRF filters and protections in, in themselves. 
Then there is the Esoteric and Shopify exchange by Andre Baptista, which discusses how he used Google, how he how he used Shopify's Google Cloud instance to subsequently allow to access their entire network and subsequently gain credential access to their services. So I guess questions. Okay, uh, questions. Yep. Hi, excellent talk, and it's such an important topic, SSRF, especially in the age of cloud. Uh, I actually hear people calling SSRF the uh, remote code execution vulnerability of the cloud. Uh, I don't know if you said that, but it's irrelevant. Uh, have you encountered any AWS instances where someone has actually deployed the Netflix meta data proxy? You can find it on GitHub. We're testing this out currently. It's supposedly fixes SSRF. Yeah, I've heard about it. It actually seems like a pretty solid solution comparatively to generally what other people have been doing or trying to use homebrew solutions which necessarily don't secure stuff. I haven't encountered it yet, but I've seen instances of where the developers have had the side of mind to either disable or enforce where the where you're able to pull the metadata credentials from. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I wonder if you could go a little bit into detail when you were looking for um, server-side request forgery vulnerabilities, um, how you go about that. Um, in particular, are there any automated tools that you're using to find them or any scripts that you can recommend? As far as um, like methodology of finding SSRF, it's actually really as simple as reading the documentation of a web application, as many developers will highlight what sort of features and abilities you're able to do. Um, in one case, I know a researcher who simply read the documentation page and then found that simply controlled F for a URL request and simply found that you could make a URL request and then subsequently access their AWS instance from that. If met, and as far as tooling, there isn't really exactly a tool, but there are t times where I would use script, where I use the script to iterate through all the ports of a, of an endpoint to see what sort of internal service that they're using. Um, more in depth for the more esoteric ways that SSRF happens, it tends to, you tend to find those in cases where the web application either processes videos or, or, or image files and you're using image magic or FMPEG and that tends to come and happen in common either in video hosting services or websites where images are being uploaded or hosted local or hosted locally on the service. Okay, uh, any further questions in the room? Okay, well thank you very much.